Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to the latest in the series of CMI's Leading Lights. This year at CMI, we celebrate our 75th anniversary. And as part of the celebrations, we're bringing together prominent leaders from across our community to learn more about what's helped to shape their career and their views on some of the most important and burning issues for leaders uh, now and over the, the next couple of years. I'm Matt Roberts. I'm the Director of Membership here at CMI. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Cindy Rampersode. Cindy is a board level senior executive and non-executive director uh, and has worked and, uh, in global businesses and across the UK uh, in the education, the marketing, the third sectors, most recently with Pearson PLC, um, and is also uh, a champion of all things ethnicity, diversity, inclusion, um, and has been cited in many occasions as, uh, as an award-winning person on this, on this side of things. Cindy, it's great to have you with us today and many thanks for joining us. Uh, nice to see you, Matt, and thank you for inviting me to um, this session today. Thanks, Cindy. Great to have you with us, as I say. We're going to cover quite a lot of depth over the next hour or so, and um, really keen, I guess, just to kick the session off um, by just thinking about some of the core fundamentals of, of your values and how do you feel that sort of values, ethics, culture are really at the heart of professional management and, and, and why is that important to you? So, I mean, I think they are um, core um, to um, what an organization looks like, how an organization um, succeeds, and they're really intertwined. Um, and I think, you know, historically, um, organizations may well have been focused on, uh, you know, productivity, profitability, growth, um, the kind of hard, harder measures. Um, I think now more than ever, um, what an organization stands for and how it achieves those goals um, is even more crucial in terms of its, its brand. Um, and I think some of that has been um, what we've been through over the last few years, so COVID, um, but also um, the murder of George, um, George Floyd, um, the whole ESG agenda. I think what we're seeing more and more is that employees, stakeholders, um, partners, are holding businesses and governments actually to account. And it's not just about what they do, but it's about how they do it. And that that becomes a really important part of their brand um, and how they're, they're kind of perceived in, in the marketplace. Um, so I think, you know, it, it is it's core. And I think it's an issue that that not, is not just um, at exec level, but it's throughout the organisation and actually something that boards need to have sight of. And we know that they do anyway around the ESG um, agenda. So I think um, really thinking about organisations as living, breathing, human um, uh beings as well as um, ones that produce products and services. It's about how you do what you do and and it's about creating an environment where the ethics are are seen as um, as kind of attractive and inclusive um, going forward. So I think yeah lo lots of scrutiny and actually a lot of um, scrutiny but also holding to account by employees and and customers in their own right. Absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely core, fundamental to the way in which organisations should be led and how they function. Uh, and as you say, everybody has a role in helping to create that culture and so forth. Just just maybe some reflections from, from yourself on on how those those values, that commitment to ethics really manifests itself in your everyday practice. Yeah, so I guess for me, one of the things that um, I've always felt very strongly about is that um, your workforce is representative of your client base um, and your beneficiary base, um, but also that you really, really know your beneficiaries and you know your customers and you know your consumers. Um, and I think, you know, going way back into the start of my career in media, you know, there it was about how you use data, how you use working groups, how you test responsiveness um, I think now um, it's it's even, all of that is is as I said before even more crucial um, but the everyday practices are very much about you know knowing your consumers and your customers really well understanding what they're thinking understanding what their values are being able to respond to it in in an authentic way not in a in a kind of tick box way but also within your organization you know think about your talent think about um the skill set and actually um 
look at being representative of, of the audience that you serve. And, and that's about really um, building out a clear talent strategy. And that talent strategy is very much about, you know, identifying talent, um, pulling talent up, but also creating, I think, an environment that is truly um, transparent and inclusive and creates those opportunities um, for individuals and how you support. Um, so I think everyday practices, it's about the culture that you create and the environment um, and and really um, the employees feeling fully engaged to help make the organization successful, but also being really clear and close to who your customers and consumers are. Absolutely. That's fabulous. Thank you. And just um, I'm intrigued just to learn a little bit more about sort of the, the early part of your career, Cindy. So yeah. back in the days in the, in the media sector, you mentioned earlier on, perhaps you can talk us through perhaps some of the challenges that you faced early in your career uh, and, and then maybe think, sort of focusing on challenges that maybe still exist now and, and, and how you can sort of help others to overcome those uh, today. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it was it's a good reflection question, because I think what I would say about challenges is that I think things have changed, but quite clearly not quickly enough. Um, and I think if I look back at my earlier career, um, there were many challenges around sponsorship not being embedded, mentoring not being necessarily embedded. Um, I think um, when I look back, there weren't the kind of networks and support networks and infrastructures that are in place now to kind of help really promote and support women and and um, people of colour and other um, groups um, to kind of lean into each other, have the conversations, but really look at what the change needs to be. But I was reflecting on this point and thinking about my early career and I trained as an accountant um, and I remember um, as an auditor going around visiting various clients and I remember um, a I did an audit of a, a high street retailer and their group financial controller was a woman. And I remember thinking, wow, isn't that amazing? It's like, you know, she just seemed like this kind of, um, you know, amazing person that kind of achieved loads and she was the group financial controller she wasn't the cfo and so for me my reflection on that is that the role modeling is really important and role modeling isn't necessarily about looking up role modeling is about seeing people that are like you um, and actually making you think about can you aspire can you can you um you know look to do those roles so that stayed with me was that the, this individual was the the you know the, the group's C, um uh, financial controller um and and the impact that had but it's interesting because if you roll forward now and you look at the FTSE I think um I'm looking at my notes now but I think um there are currently 15 CFOs who are women in the FTSE 100 now over 50 percent of the population are women so there is still a long long way to go so it's great that there's now the CFOs but but a long way to go um and we know that you know if you look at data in terms of the challenges so I'd say the challenges going back to the challenges I'd say there wasn't enough role modeling there wasn't kind of structure around mentoring and I think there was a general acceptance of of you kind of go along with the with the flow um and maybe looking back there wasn't the same encouragement around aspiration and ambition um i think some of that still exists but there's more dialogue about it now and there's more data um and and you know we talked earlier about organizations being held to account i mean things like the cbi um change the race ratio the work that cmi are doing are, are all parts of that but you know a couple of things that really struck me the C cmi themselves you guys have done some work on this and you know what the data shows is that there's only five percent of senior leaders who are from who are who are of color um in in senior FTSE roles uh, there are eight, um, 11 people, the Green Park um, and, um, reporting showed there are only 11 people of colour in the key roles within the FTSE 100. So that's CEO, chair, CFO. So clearly there were some challenges, but clearly um, some progress has been made, but, but a long, long way to go. And so I guess what I would be saying to... Um, to people in their career, starting their careers now is, um, is I think, you know, it, it's, it's things like um, uh, seeking out sponsorship, 
um, looking for your mentors, um, creating the networks, um, having the dialogue. And, and I also think, you know, finding the right culture and the right organisations for you and being kind of passionate about what you want to be doing. So I think loads still to be done in this space. And, and actually, the more I delve, the more I had questions because even little things like not little big things like you know the level of investment for female entrepreneurs as opposed to male entrepreneurs and the disparity there and that's been reported on recently so I think we have a long way to go to continue to break these barriers down I think it's great we're having these conversations I think we need to be careful with some of these conversations that um that the whole is moving and not just the part um and i think in that you know we'll, we'll especially around um some of the activities that have been um championed yeah really interesting points there Cindy. in particular it resonates with me that piece about the whole moving role and just some parts of 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 the whole uh we'll come back to that and explore that in a little bit more detail in a few moments if we can um yeah. so yeah progress made but still such a long way to go and um elements like sponsorship like mentoring are going to play a key role in that and, and i guess part of what you're saying is that people shouldn't settle they, they shouldn't just accept that this is the way it is and that actually being prepared to challenge is is, is part of what really needs to to happen as uh, as we look to accelerate our progress towards greater equity just in terms of thinking about the last few years and we've been in a period of a, a real turbulence, huge amounts of change in so many different ways uh, in our professional lives and 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 in more in a more broader sense. Um, one of the things I'm interested just to get your view on today is is how do organisations and institutions find the right balance between continuity on the one hand and and the change that organisations need to make to to keep pace with the expectations of the day. I'm, I'm just interested to to hear a little bit more from you on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that um, change is a necessary part of continuity. Um, and it always has been, but it's even more so now. And I guess if you look at some of the, the key things around um, this question is that we're working, aren't we, in an environment right now where um, because of not just because of COVID, but actually there are some broader factors at play. But um, if you have things like the impact of COVID and what that's meant for um, changing work practices. You've got an environment where we've got a global skills shortage. You've got an environment where um, there are some real challenge around supply chain. Um, you've got um, things happening because of COVID and technological advancement that um, whereas businesses were taking six to seven years on average to roll out new products and services and new ways of working. They're doing that in a matter of months. And I've seen that in my own um, sector and in my own um, line of work. Um, so businesses are having to, to really respond quickly to all of those factors. And that's not just about the business, but the key element of business. It's, it's how businesses are responding and relating to um, their employees and their customer base and how they're, they're, they're supporting and interacting with them. So for me, um, you know, when I look at the impact of COVID, I think organisations that will come out of this better will be the ones that have a clear strategy. They know what they're about. And, and it's interesting because strategy isn't about being fixed. It's about it being able to evolve. It's about how they um you know they, how agile they are how how they can pivot really quickly it goes back you know it's, it's that the the whole thing about being able to to change in order to be able to continue but at the heart of it is about um the culture the culture of organizations and one of inclusivity um and the inclusivity and access of employees but also the wider customer base and really thinking about talent not just in terms of you know pulling talent up in the organization and upskilling talent and thinking about the talent pipeline but thinking about talent slightly differently in the context of well-being um uh -huh. thinking about talent slightly differently in terms of the context of um you know, what might hybrid working mean? And actually, what are some of the challenges around hybrid working and working from home? So I guess the things that I pull out there is that um, uh, if you look at your employee strategy or your talent strategy, 
if you go down a route as an organization of hybrid working or working from home, that could work for many. But for young people, for women, for people of color, for people who just can't work at home, that's a real challenge. And you've also then got some challenges around um, access and visi visibility and progression. So I think, you know, change is the constant and you have for, to be you know, continual and and be successful as a business. Um, but I think how you respond and thinking about your clear strategy, thinking about your people strategy slightly differently um, is going to be really, really crucial. Indeed, absolutely. And, you know, within um, what you've just said, you, you, you touched on the importance of inclusivity. And, um, and we, we know that it, it's not just right as leaders to be inclusive. I mean, it, it, it's not just that it's the right thing. It actually also delivers benefits to the organisations that people are leading in, multitude, in a multitude of different ways. I'm keen just to sort of explore that a little bit more um, with you and, and just sort of thinking perhaps about some of the practical things that, that you as a senior leader have done, um, perhaps around how you've gone about ensuring that as many women as men within your, your teams and organisations have been able to fulfil their their management ambitions, how you've gone about improving uh, the diversity of ethnic re representation within your teams. I'm really keen just to hear some practical insights yeah. from you on, on those points. Yeah, and I, I think on that, I mean, in terms of my own approach, um, I think I've always been um, very aware of identifying talent um, and putting the support in for them. So putting in sponsorship, putting in reverse mentoring, um, actually taking a chance even when people think that they're not quite ready because in my very early career I remember um, wondering whether I was ready for particular roles and people took a chance and it and it had you know a it instilled huge confidence but it also made me progress so for me I think um, talent and individuals may not necessarily be complete who is complete when they start a new role and knows everything and actually if they do there there's probably something wrong so I think it's um for me it's been um it's been about the sponsorship it's been about the mentoring it's about it's been about taking chances um uh personally it's also been about um engaging in discussions about why this matters um not just on a human level but actually what it means for organizational resilience and and success and growth and how they relate um to customers so you know the thought leadership that we did um, when I was at Pearson, I sponsored a piece of work looking at um, the impact of COVID and the widening inequalities gap. And, and you know, that particularly that particular piece of work look, looks particularly at um, what do we have to think about and act on now for for women to make sure women sort of stay engaged and are not excluded and young people um, entering the workplace for the first time. Um, but also some of the, um, you know, what might be affecting um different communities um, across the country. So for me, I think it's been about identifying talent. It's been about um, leading by example. It has been about um, uh, sponsoring and pulling up. But I also think it's been about um, starting some of the uncomfortable discussions, but creating a safe environment. Um, and I think it's about, it, you know, it's about challenging the right way. Um, for change. Um, and I guess at, at Pearson as well, I led the global DNI task force. Um, and the outputs of that were very much about a talent strategy, a product strategy, um, but also thinking about data um, and how you use data to a, say where you are as an organization, but where you aspire to go to and and holding people to account. So I think there are there are a number of different things. Um, but I you know, I also love mentoring um, people at different stages of their organisation. So this morning, for example, I had a call with somebody who is a PA who was questioning whether they should apply for a job because they're on maternity leave. And it's like part of me shocked that a woman still asks that question. And it's like, no, don't put limitations in place for yourself. It's like, go and do it. And I think also as leaders, um, you know, I'd also give the example of another PA who um, worked for me in the media industry, who went off and became a product um, lead um, in the media sector. 
And it was really clear that's what she wanted to do. And so we found a way of of actually helping her to kind of go on a course and build out her skills. And and actually, I think you create goodwill, but also what you do is you really allow people to flourish. And it might be in your organization or it might be in another organization. So for me, it's it's let's not limit um, individuals, but let's look at how they can really um, shine and, and support them. And it and it's across all levels. Absolutely. Um, one of the points you touched on uh, a moment ago was, was around the sort of conversations that you might need to have with people. And um, I think one of the interesting things over probably the past, past 18 months is the way in which, as you, you referred to earlier on, we've, we've been prepared, I think, on a societal level to have more conversations about the disparities of opportunity uh, that, that exist based on issues around discrimination. Um, I'm thinking particularly about the confidence that people have and that leaders have in opening up conversations, for example, about the impact of race on opportunity um, and uh, and so forth. I myself, up until about 15 months ago, would have been very nervous opening a conversation with a colleague around those sorts of issues. Um, very glad that I did it, but really interested in your, your sort of thoughts on how important it is that we help managers and leaders to develop fluency in holding conversations around issues around inclusivity and diversity, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's crucial, but I also think it's it's crucial to developing leaders and, and, and full leaders um, who are truly empathetic and, and know, um, you know, know their employees, know their organizations, know their customers. Um, I mean, what I would say is, and I've seen many examples of this over the last couple of years, and actually even before, is that, people are uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable about saying the wrong thing. They're uncomfortable about um, offending. And, and my position on this is, is really clear, is that if people use the wrong words or people are clumsy, and I've seen it happen, um, if the intent is right, then that's okay. And actually what we should be doing is creating an environment where we understand our organisation, we understand where organisations are on this journey, we understand as leaders how... how people are feeling um, and we we create an environment that's safe where we are you know we're clear that we're we're listening um, we're learning um, organizations and leaders are learning um, and that they are actively saying that they want to to act on what they're hearing to improve um, the organization for the better and to to create a more inclusive, um, representative, fair environment for, for everybody. Um, so I think um, it, you know, c coming at it from a position of compassion and empathy and wanting to learn and wanting to understand and recognizing that you're not always going to get it right is what's really, really crucial. And and I think I think all of this is is important as well. And the whole thing around uh, allyship and true inclusion because one of the things that's also happened a little bit over the last couple of years is you know if we don't if we don't move the conversation forward in 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 a kind of truly inclusive way what you end up with is um you kind of you either end up with um people being scared and disempowered and so there's kind of an element you could even say of kind of resentment and you want to surface that you want to be able to have the, the kind of conversations but what you also don't want is um it to also become quite tribal and we've seen this as well and we talked about this when we chatted earlier this week where you know the conversation starts about race and 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 if people don't feel involved in that conversation or they don't understand the context or what the value is um that you end up with, you know, the dialogue about white working class young men, which, of course, is a really important point, And we should be focusing on that as well and looking at true inclusivity. But but what you don't want is it to become tribal and it not being about a conversation that includes everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, leaders have been nervous about this, um, but but a lot of leaders have also been incredibly um brave and embraced and learned um and and i think um it's about getting to know people as people i think um, I, I mentioned that i'd work i was working with somebody who'd lived in london their whole life and when all of these conversations started one of the things they said to me was 
you know, I've just realized I don't have any black friends. And so my reaction was, gosh, I'm so sorry for you. But, you know, what what, what a shame for you. Um, but I kind of thought it's it's about coming out of your bubble and learning yeah. about those around you um, in, in your organization, but but broader than that. So, I, you know, and actually it's it's enriching and it's 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 the right thing to do, but it's it's incredibly enriching for those leaders as well and helping them to be more complete leaders i think mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. okay and so i i think that's a brilliant sort of way of sort of looking at this this issue cindy in terms of you know if you're the person opening conversation check your intent if you're yeah. the recipient of, of that conversation being open then try and see the intent and 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 that can can help to create a safe space in which to to have a, an open conversation about what whatever uh, the issue may be um you mentioned earlier on that there's, there's a danger sometimes of um, maybe parts of an issue being moved forward, but not not the, the whole of an issue. Um, and you've just also talked about the, the danger of focusing too much on one area and, and creating a, almost a tribal sort of situation and, 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 and risking more, more division, I guess. Um, when we're looking as leaders at addressing discrimination in the workplace, how do you feel this should this should happen is it about sort of looking at individual protected characteristics one by one or or is there sort of more common threads that that if we look at as a whole might help to to move things forward more quickly i mean i think it's both isn't it i mean i think you need you need the common threads which are about um uh everybody being able to show up as their true self um that everybody being able to feel part of an organization and and an organization having um you know processes and systems and a culture that is truly inclusive but i think you have to look at individual protective characteristics as well and i say this because if you look at um the brilliant work that was done by um the likes of the 30 percent club and, uh, and others on women brilliant brilliant bits of work and it's moved the dial as i said i think 25 percent of women on the FTSE are now women and 30% of board members, although we still need to get to 50% because that's the, the kind of population average. Um, but what the people that benefited the most from um, the 30% club, and I'm sure people who drive the 30% club won't mind me saying this, have been white women. And that's that's you know, that's that's a fact. But actually, if you're not looking at the kind of characteristics, you're, you're not really going to move the dial in its broadest sense. And I think, you know, if you look at things like um, the LGBTQ community, um, really understanding some of the challenges they're facing, um, uh, living and, and walking their experiences, not just in the UK, but in other countries where, you know, we're talking here, a lot of your members are global organisations. Um, we need to be very careful on this point about uh protected characteristics um that we're not looking at it just through the lens as well of a, of a kind of western world but actually as global organizations we've got operations in many other countries and so understanding those unique challenges for women lgbtq communities um migrant workers in in different countries um will be different and so you need to you need to flex your your policies or your measurements or your your kind of scrutiny to to be able to kind of capture some of that. So I think you know, yeah, you need the the overall, but you you must drill down as well. And of course, the ideal is you've kind of got intersectionality, um, and it all moves forward. But but in reality, um, we've seen from from you know initiatives and um, and data that 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 doesn't happen if you put the lens on something that moves forward for a bit, but other things kind of drop off. So you need both, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And you, you've also touched on the importance of data. And um, yeah. I, I wonder if we can just sort of take a moment or two just to think a bit more in depth about that. So, you know, all of the time technology is advancing, uh, evolving at a rapid pace. And I'm just thinking about what evidence-based equality might look like for some of the, the different groups that we've we've touched on um, earlier and, and how can we use data to help move that dial and to to get towards that more equitable position that we're striving for i mean i think the first thing i'd say is that if you set up mechanisms that capture data 
and measure data and you've kind of got government initiatives like the, the stuff around equal pay and women, you see a movement, you see a shift. Um, so there's no doubt that data can play a really crucial role. Um, I think data, um, certainly when I look at um, DE&I over the last few years and particularly around race, um, it's been fantastic in telling organisations where they are. Um, it also sets benchmarks, so things like the, you know, change the race ratio, the, the the CBI initiative in terms of what does good look like, what do your peer group look like, where should you be aspiring to get to, makes it really clear. I think one of the, some of the challenges around data, though, is that um, uh, you need to set, um, you need to, you need to kind of set the targets and the KPIs in line with your business goals, and you also, I think, need to link them um, very much to performance management of, of, of leaders in organizations and managers in organizations. Um, so, so data is great, um, but but it's not the it's not the whole story. And I think one of my one of my concerns sometimes with data is that it can become a bit of a tick box exercise. So I guess if you look at some of the gender data, does it tell you enough about have have people moved up the pay bands, um, for example? Um, the NHS would be a really great example of that, where you've got big um, swathes of women um, at the the kind of entry level, but actually, you probably have in the NHS as well at the at the more senior levels. Is probably not a good example, but I guess that's the the challenge with data: is that does it tell you the right information? Um, the other thing is that you can't always get full disclosure, and you know, going back to my point about global organisations working in multiple countries. Um, the legislation doesn't exist. Um, culturally, people are not comfortable or fearful about disclosure. Um, and so data is one part of it, but it's not the only part. Um, it certainly helps you, as I said, know where you are, where you need to get to and 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 the kind of peer measurements. But I think there's more to it than just data for global organisations um, and, and just making sure you're getting the right a, the right um, disclosures and engagement, but also the right granularity at, at, at some points to really understand true progress. Um, I mean, maybe the thing as well is how you overlay all of that with um, your employee engagement surveys and what mm -hmm. those are telling you, because um, it's, it's not just about the data in isolation. But my fear is that it could become a bit of a tick box exercise rather than a true management tool for driving talent and business forward mm -hmm. absolutely the, 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 there's, there's always that risk i guess and and one of the key things that just picking up on the on the themes that you've covered is is that sort of disclosure piece and and people's confidence in mm -hmm. disclosing um information about themselves that may not be visually obvious for example yeah. um and I, I just wonder sort of coming if if I dare slightly into this sort of more Western sort of approach where perhaps the culturally uh, and certainly in terms of legislation where, where we, we have slightly more liberal sort of opportunity. Um, what do you think is is sort of key to building the confidence that a person feels confident in disclosing information about themselves and understands why why that information is needed? I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it comes back to um, creating those safe environments um, and communicating um, why organisations are looking to get the data and actually how it can help individuals um, be their whole self in an organisation um, and what that means for performance of teams and performance of the business um, and how they interact with, with customers, for example. Um, I think there's also work that can be done where organisations need to influence where they work in some of these markets. So, you know, one of the areas that I feel very strongly about, as you know, is um, women and young girls in kind of developing um, countries. And, you know, you might have women who in some instances are just trying to access the workplace or education um, and they're, they're kind of lost and they're not counted really in, in any data. And then you've got other markets where you've got individuals who are hugely qualified but never get beyond a certain level. So I think some of that is 
opening the conversations. It's holding those leaders that are there to account. It's it's creating a broader conversation that's not just about the individual business in those markets, but but kind of but kind of broader. And I know, um, you know, we we did some work with you and 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 Wilson Park looking at. The, the importance of women in the workplace um, in terms of dealing with this global skills challenge, um, but, but you know, creating the opportunity um, um, for them as well. So I, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's that safe environment, isn't it? And it's making sure leaders, leaders create that safe environment and the kind of communication and, and helping people on that journey but it's not you know going back to my point it's not just about the data it's it's a lot more than the data and and there's this global global dimension as well yeah so leaders being seen to take positive action as a result of the understanding yeah. that they get from a, a variety of sources including the data is uh, is an important sort of facet of, of how we move things forward um, there's a number of other questions that I want to, to throw you away in a moment or two, Cindy, but just for those of us, uh, those that are watching us live today, uh, if you've got a question for Cindy, then please do uh, type it into the chat and uh, we'll look to get through as many as we can before the end of the broadcast. Um, but before we go on to those questions, Cindy, I, I'm really keen to focus in on the, the last sort of two years or so. And um, I guess what one of the things I'm keen to understand is what you've learned, how you've adapted your your leadership style through the the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, you know the last two years have been quite something for for many people, and I think you know for for many disproportionately more challenging and and harder. Um, I think in terms of leadership style, I think. Um, it's incredible, isn't it, how quickly we all pivoted to this way of, of being and existing. But I think for me, the key thing was also being really mindful of um, individuals all being on a slightly different journey and needing to stay connected um, with individuals far more broadly in the organisation. And I always say I got to know more people in the two year period during COVID within my team than I did previously because there were these smaller check-ins and larger check-ins and really trying to tune in to what was going on and and creating an environment where um, people didn't feel isolated. So things like putting buddying um, check-ins in place, um, being aware of where people had young children and what some of those challenges were. Um, I'm a mum. I remember when my two were younger. I mean, if I was trying to do homeschooling with um, two under sixes or two under eights and and being, you know, trying to do a, a demanding job, that's that's quite something. So so just giving the flexibility and just saying it's OK if your, your, your screen is on and the, the child is is on your side. It's like I mean, in some ways, one of the things it did, um, COVID did, was it made us see people as human. Um, and, and the full facet, I guess, of of a person rather than people turn up in a very professional, robotic, not necessarily em emotional, authentic way. But actually, you, you know, as a leader, I think what you what what COVID did was was that was that was what you as a leader needed to do. You needed to be empathetic and you needed to to really um, get to know individuals as 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 individuals. I think also um, thinking about um, flexibility um, and um, and agility and um, well, flexibility is that, you know, it's it's not necessarily about nine to five. Um, but I think we were thinking about that beforehand, most of us anyway. Um, yeah. uh, and and how and, and all of that is important for access. Um, but I think the thing about COVID is I think it's not so much. I think there was a lot that we learned, but I think there's a lot that has happened as a result that will continue and it's more about how we build on that and it's more about how we make sure that um you know that that we're building out those empathetic skills actually one of the things i was thinking about was that um you know it's interesting that i i i'm really passionate about vocational education and skills and enrichment and all that kind of stuff and we as a society really value kind of academics and outputs and hard stats and businesses do as well actually it's not just in education so my reflection is it's exactly the same in business it's shareholder value and eps and all that kind of stuff but you need humans to help you do all of that 
But what I reflect on is that even more now than ever, the importance of kind of life skills and soft skills embedded from early years is even more crucial so you know helping individuals as they kind of move to adulthood to have those skills around team and network and empathy and different ways of engaging is even more crucial so I think and that's important for the leaders of the future so um, uh -huh. so there was some stuff that we've all learned all reflected on but actually for me the really important bit as well is like what does that mean for the leaders of the future Sure. So, yeah, let's okay. embed enrichment in, in curriculum. Yeah. And so many positive changes, actually, to, to leadership that you know, you've touched on there. And I wonder what you think about whether society as a whole has, has now got a different view of managers and leaders as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, I mean, I think I think there's been so much has changed but I would go back to what I said earlier which is that we also need to be quite careful that in all of that change people don't drop off um, and I think you know thinking about um, women young people um, individuals who aren't able to um, to work as easily in, in in these new environments or access these new roles um, so so all of that I think is is there's been lots of positives but but there are also a lot, a lots of um, things that we still need to be mindful of. So I just wanted to say say that bit. But your question was, sorry, was leaders of the it's future? Really bad. Yeah, and the way in which perhaps society perceives managers and leaders do, has that changed? Do you feel as a result of some of the changes in leadership style that you you mentioned? Yeah, I think people are more demanding of what they expect from their leaders in terms of. Um, expecting their leaders to be um, more human, um, more empathetic, um, to be goals driven, but actually to to live that kind of culture and DNA of an organisation and to kind of create that. Um, and I think to succeed as a leader, you, you need those um, qualities going forward. And I think it's interesting because if I look at... Um, you know, if you look at something like the, the ESG agenda, for example, uh, people are making choices about organisations that they come to. And those choices are about what they see as the brand and the leadership and the, the modelling um, that, that's, that's kind of on display. So I think, yeah, at the heart of being a really successful leader is, is empathy. Um, you, you have to still be results focused. You still have to be, you know, be able to kind of, drive an organization or drive a, a you know grow a team or, or or run an orchestra or whatever it is but but you need to be tuned into your organization's beating heart and the individuals that work in it and your customers and consumers and your your kind of partners i think mm -hmm. absolutely I don't, I don't think you can be a robotic um leader going forward i don't think they'll they'll succeed or go very far and actually going back to your one of your earlier questions about my earlier experiences, I saw a lot more of that. I saw a lot more of, you know, sitting in your office. I saw a lot more of detached, lots of hierarchy. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think it'll be a lot more fluid. I think it's it's about ideas um, all the way through. I think it's about greater engagement. Um, the good organisations were always doing that. So it's it's mm -hmm. it's also worth saying that um, yes, COVID has highlighted that this is more the norm. But there were many organisations who were doing this as well. Indeed, absolutely. Perhaps one sort of very sort of public example of leadership that no matter where we are on the globe, we um, we witness and experience is, is through political leadership. And, mm. um, you know, there's, there's been real sort of disruption and, and turbulence around different styles of political leadership uh, over recent years. Um, uh, do, do you think that maybe our political leaders have, have learned something about the importance of management and, and leadership through through the last couple of years and some of the challenges that they've faced? My goodness, that's one hell of a question. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, I think um, some political leaders clearly have and some political leaders um, are probably more detached um, from from uh, some of what we're discussing. Um I mean, I think the key thing, isn't it? It's it, it's interesting if you look at what's happened politically over the last, I don't know, 
two, three years in terms of the disengagement with with politicians or with particular governments around the world. And so people voting with their feet and and actually taking different positions. Um, sometimes that's quite scary in terms of what we've seen as, as the kind of consequence in terms of some more extreme action. But I think, um, no, I think, uh, I think politicians need to work closely with business, I think, um, understanding um, and helping to embed um, why, you know, good leadership is important for, for not just organisations, but for economies, I think is crucial. I'm skirting the question because it, it's like it's one of those where if you answer it, um, you know, honestly, it, it could be it, it, it could be quite damning in some parts, but not in all parts. I mean, I also think you see some good practice. But um, but I, my question, my, I guess my my point would be the the, the detachment from from the reality. Um, and I think getting closer to that. And that's what good leaders in organisations need to do as well is get close yeah. to the 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 feel of your organization, the 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 temperature of your organization and your customers. And I think, you know, politicians um, uh, probably with, you know, COVID has, has caused some challenges around that, but it's really, really important. So hopefully I've answered it like a politician. <laughs> no, I, th I think those parallels in terms of being immersed in the reality and not creating unnecessary distance uh, in order to be in a, a position of empathy and understanding is, uh, is is important, as you've said, across business leadership, but uh, but something that uh, if they're not already doing, then politicians could, could learn a lot from. OK, um, just before we sort of go to sort of questions from the audience, I'm, I'm just sort of keen to hear a little bit about who inspires you as a leader and, and, and why that might be? Yeah, and I thought about this um, long and hard. So, um, you know, throughout my career, lots of people have inspired me, old bosses, um, peers, people in my team. Um, you know, I look back at people that I worked with years ago at Virgin who I'm still in in um, in touch with. And what inspired me was that they were really visionary, that they they challenged me and others, um, but they really believed in, 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 in me as well. And then, you know, team members. So uh, somewhere like EMI, I had a lady working for me called Shantha Kane, who I nicked from Accenture, who was just, she inspired me because she was just so super, super smart and so capable um, and, you know, could go and do anything. Um, but I'm not ever, I wasn't quite sure then that she believed that. So, but truly inspiring. And even now, you know, you meet people through your network. You know, I was lucky enough to sit next to two amazing women at the recent CMI dinner and just blown away by them. One in, in the world of data and regulatory and just like the biggest brain on the planet. And then another entrepreneurial digital business, just amazing. And, you know, the the both Pinky and, and Alison, the recipients. So every day you meet amazing people um, and you can continually inspired by them. Um, and, you know, world, world leaders as well, like, you know, Barack Obama or, or Nelson Mandela. But I've picked Maya Angelou as my um, most inspirational leader. And I quote from her all the time. And I think what I love about her as an individual is her humility, but also her humor. And a woman who has had or had lived experiences that were really hard and she turned that adversity into something positive. So she learned from it, um, she became stronger from it, she was confident, um, she shared um, and, you know, Everything about her is was authentic, about humility, about empathy, about humor and fun. Um, but there was also a steeliness. You know, it's like I, one of her quotes that I love is like um, when people tr show you their true self, believe it. So what she's effectively saying is if people are really horrible, believe it and don't keep trying. So there's this sort of steeliness as well as all of the kind of confidence, inspiring stuff. Um, and I think if more leaders could could have and hold some of those qualities of empathy, humility, humor, authenticity, learning, sharing, my goodness, I think um, we'd be in a much better place. And we would be in a place where it created an environment of people showing up as themselves as kind of inclusion and, and access. Yeah, fabulous. I, I think she's a, a great role model. And uh, as you say, so many qualities that she brings that um 
really should be part of the leadership development curriculum, I guess. Um, it should, it should. There's, there's something you should patent quickly. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, um, let's, let's think about your vision. You, you, you talked about some of your sort of inspirational sort of uh, figures in your career have been visionary. What, do, what does a better, fairer society look like to you, Cindy? I mean, a better, fairer society is where people don't need to apologise for who they are or and actually they feel they've got a seat at the table or on the dance floor or whatever the expression is. And um, that, you know, that there, there aren't barriers and that actually what we see is representation of our society in every walk of our life. I think that's that's what it looks like. And it's not just... I keep going back to it's not just the UK, it's also what's happening around us caring about what happens with women and young people and LGBT communities in, in, in other countries. Um, what makes it happen? I think these types of conversations, I think data and government sponsoring and um, policy, I think actually um, the holding to account um, of and the scrutiny by employees and and um, and customers, those sorts of things start to change. To change the dial, um, and um, and people not not being tolerant of, of stuff that they see that they shouldn't be tolerant of, um, but but obviously doing it in the right way and, and a respectful way. And we talked earlier, didn't we, about um, about the kind of fluency piece. So um, I I'm always hopeful that we can move stuff forward. But we move stuff forward when you stop and look at the data at such um, a slow pace. Um, so I think it's it's accelerating some of these um, conversations and and thinking about stuff like the mentoring initiatives going beyond what we do here, but, you know, um, in other places as well. Absolutely. Um, Great. But, yeah, it's a place where people show up and they feel comfortable and they see themselves. Absolutely. Thank you. So, look, last question from me, and then we're, we're going to go to the audience. Um, but if, if you were to sort of give a brief statement summarising the impact that, that you see managers and leaders making every day um, uh, as, as one piece of advice to the government, what would that be, Cindy? I didn't, I missed that. I, I beg your pardon. Um, I think I cut out for a moment there. So if I was to ask you to give a brief statement summarising the impact that managers and leaders make every day um, and that could help to advise our government, what, what would that statement sound like? Oh, my gosh, advise our government. Um, so I think the first thing I'd say is the impact leaders have and management have on or managers have on their teams is huge and it's not to be underestimated. Um, and there's that big thing saying, isn't it, that people leave managers invariably or leaders not organizations and and it's and it's so true and in order to be successful it's thinking about how you retain how you develop um talent in terms of advice for government i've got i've got a few the, well not too many things because you'll rein me back in but i think that the first thing i'd say on government around this whole agenda is is think about policy around data and data being more about gender but also including um race um stuff gbtq and and um disability so really kind of look at, at at data and and collating that and creating that environment of holding to account um i think um government also needs to think long and hard and and work i mean it's interesting that there's all this talk about leveling up um my worry like many others is that leveling up leveling up becomes a becomes rhetoric and also assumed to be happening by osmosis and one of the problems with that of course is that lots of people fall out and and are are missed and so I think yeah. really being intentional about um access and DEI does not necessarily equal access I don't think is why I was working through but being really clear about access and and skills and actually as we come out of COVID how people enter those new markets or those new careers or get the right skills for a digital world or you know mm -hmm. hybrid working or, or whatever it is so I think government thinking about data policy but then thinking about um, how people access through skills and through learning and my third on government is really celebrate the the value of people who do vocational education and 
people who are doing entry level and intermediate level roles in our society because we need them and we celebrated them during COVID and we seem to have forgotten to continue mm. celebrating them. So how do you also support those people in terms of progress and, and skills and independence and all of those great things? It's great Thank answer. you. So fun. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic points there, Cindy. Thank you. And I, I particularly like your 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 sort of almost sort of watchword around access and that EDI doesn't necessarily equal access. So I, I think that's a really important uh, important point for us to all be mindful of. Um, we have got some questions from the audience and uh, thank you to everybody that's, uh, that's submitted questions. The, the first one comes from Ed. Uh, hi, Ed. Um, and Ed, Ed says, actually, he's picking up on something that you mentioned a moment ago. It's widely known that one of the main reasons people leave jobs is because of poor management or leadership. What are your thoughts, Cindy, on how we raise self-awareness of managers and leaders in relation to the impact that their behaviour can have on their colleagues? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question because I think actually, I think, um, you know, all there's lots of research has been done on this and it does say people leave um, leaders and managers, not necessarily the business. I mean, what I would say on it is also empower yourself um, to to actually um, seek out opportunities and work in cultures that are right for you. Um, so, and, and I think I said that right at the beginning is like, do what you're passionate about, find the right culture, find the right organization. Um, I think in terms of organizations, I think it's about how they reward um, and what are they rewarding? Are they just rewarding you achieving your sales and profit margin? Or are they rewarding your employee engagement scores? Are they, are they um, rewarding um, your talent strategy? Are they um, rewarding the data on DE and I? Um, and I think it's also then, um, you know, I think people being aware of the impact that they have on others and, and tools like 360 is really powerful for this. Um, but, I, but I think it's about organisations rewarding the right stuff um also individuals taking control um and then i think the third element is um is around um i've forgotten data i think it was that i said yeah mm -hmm. absolutely great thank you um i think we've got time to squeeze in one more question from uh, this time from erland and erland asks uh, how long do you anticipate that cultural the, the cultural changes required to will take to realign values, behaviours from a historic sort of commercial KPIs yeah, focus. Values and behaviours from historic. More around ESG and diversity. Yeah. So, I mean, I think cultural change is continual as well, isn't it? So change is continual. I actually think some of this change is going to be accelerated. And I think it goes back to what I said. I've been saying, I think, through the conversation which is the scrutiny and the accountability and it's funny on this one of the things that I that popped into my head as I saw this question was I was watching Dragon's Den um, a couple of weeks ago and there's a, a new young dragon on there and there's Sarah Davies and there was a conversation uh, somebody did a pitch for an AI tool in a care home um, and it could do everything and it could increase productivity and reduce costs and what struck me was their reaction to that, which was, mm -hmm. it's great, you can do that, but do I really want, I think the exact quote was, do I need, do I want the, the robot giving my grand pills? Um, and they saw the need for empathy and human and emotional connection. So I think it'll happen quicker because people are being demanding, employees and customers, consumers are being more demanding about how, how, how organizations do what they do and how they walk the talk really um Indeed. and that will be a key component of shareholder success and shareholder value going forward absolutely i'm rushing my answer because i'm aware of time well look cindy we are we are at time as you, as you say but um thank you so much for joining us today uh, i thoroughly enjoyed the the last hour and i hope those watching have uh, have also uh, found today really insightful um Thank you to everybody that submitted questions. And if you want to know more about what we're doing to celebrate the, the 75th anniversary of CMI, including our work around equality, diversity and inclusion, uh, there's a link in the chat. And uh, if you're already a member, then please do dive into uh, Management Direct to learn more about all of the topics that we've covered today. If you're not yet a member, then again, there's a link in the chat and uh, we'd very much like to, to see you taking a look at what we have to offer and coming on board uh, in the near future. 
but in the meantime, Cindy, many thanks once again for joining us today and for all that you do for, for CMI. You're very welcome. Thank you. You stay on board for a moment. Please come. <laughs>